Summer of the Mari Posies, The Mermaid. The Mermaid, the woman who wants to take your papa away. No, we won't let her. Chapter eight. It wasn't easy getting out of INS's house without letting her know what was going on. First, I had to buy all the newspapers at the Pescado and put them in the trunk of the car so nobody else would see them. After I got back to the dead man's house, I told INS they were all out of newspapers. Then we ate breakfast in record time. We split before any of the neighbors had shown up for the wake, leaving behind most of the dead man's money inside the container of sugar on the table, tightly wrapped in its plastic bag, like a great big tip for our hostess. I only kept enough for us to buy food and gas for the trip home after visiting Abuta. We're in trouble, big trouble, I told Juanita and the twins once we got down the road in my father's beat up Nova. What do you mean, Juanita asked. She was sticking her head out the window, admiring her new hat in the side mirror. INS had given it to her at breakfast when Juanita had comp complained about how much her skin hurt because she'd got too much sun on the way down to El Sacrificio. It was one of those fancy white summer straw hats you see brides wearing at their wedding reception. Only this one wasn't so fancy with a clump of saggy old silk flowers hanging off to the side. It was so big on her, Juanita had to hold it on with both hands, but she didn't care that it was too, it was old. In fact, she loved it. Here, I said, keeping an eye on the road as I reached under the seat to pull out a copy of the day's newspapers. Look for yourself. We're all over the front page. I bet by now every channel on TV is running the story about our abduction. Canessa Sinenko Hernandez, the Garcia girls, taken from their home in their own father's car. Where did you get this? Vilya asked, snatching the paper out of my hand and staring at it with her twin in the back seat. Juanita turned around and leaned over the front seat to read along. Descrabazos eos dios mear. What are we going to do? Delia pulled out a corner of the paper to get a closer look. We have to go home, Delia whispered, horrified. Poor mama, she must be worried sick about us. I'm sure she is, I said, keeping my hands on the wheel, but mama's got problems of her own. It's, is she all right? What happened to her? Juanita voice trembled almost as much as the sad looking flowers on her hat. Calamita. She's all right, I said. Nothing's wrong with her, at least not physically. Oh, thank God, she said, putting a hand on her chest and breathing out gratefully. You know, I can't take you serious with that ridiculous thing on your head, I said, looking sideways at her. You look like the Mad Hatter. Juanita took the frumpy hat off and threw it out the window. I don't care about that stupid hat. What happened to mama? Be behind us, the hat spun out into the morning air in a white blur, like a miniature flying saucer and landed right smack in the middle of the highway. I watched it get smaller and smaller until it disappeared from sight in the rear view mirror. Litterbug, you know that's against the law, don't you? Stop stalling, Juanita ranted from her seat at the far end of the car. What's going on with mama? Why did you say she's got problems of her own? Ma. With one hand on the wheel, I took the paper from Vilia in the back seat and handed it back to Juanita, pointing at the newsprint at the bottom of the page. It says it right there. She's a person of interest in the investigation of our disappearance. As of last night, she's not allowed to leave the country. So she can't come to Mexico to look for us, 
Papa's in trouble too. I'd never seen a newspaper back home say such things about people possibly involved in crimes who had been who hadn't been arrested. But Mexican papers were quick to report speculations. They took information from anyone willing to talk and didn't hold back critical details the way the US papers sometimes did. Papa? Delia and Velia asked simultaneously, looking at me in the rear view mirror. What's he got to do with this? Velia continued. He's a person of interest too, I explained. How? Why? Juanita inquired. Her eyes widened in disbelief. Read the story, I said. It's right there in the second to last paragraph. Juanita unfolded the paper and began to read. The authorities are looking for Ernesto Garza, the father of the missing girls. He has wanted for questioning in an unexplained disappearance of his daughters. Local police are also hoping to recover Garza's vehicle as it might provide critical evidence as to the whereabouts of the girls. They think we're dead, Vilya said, and that Papa has something to do with it. I adjusted the rear view mirror so I could make eye contact with her. Not necessarily. They always investigate the parents first. Look at this, Juanita said after flipping through the paper. There's a story about Papa on page two. I glanced at a picture of Papa, but had to keep my eye on the road. So I couldn't read the article beside it. What does it say? Local singer wanted for investigation in the case of missing children. Juanita showed the paper to the twins in the back seat. They used his publicity photo, the one of him in the Macarita suit. He's gonna hate that. Nah, they'll be glad they used that shot. It's a good picture of him, Delia said. Delia leaned in to look at the picture. I forgot how handsome he is. Oh, he's handsome all right. Juanita's tone of voice told us exactly how she felt about him. She didn't need to explain what she meant with that comment, but she did anyways. My grandpa, and he knows it too. Look at him mugging for the camera, like a possum with a mouthful of worms. Funny, I never noticed before how conceited he really is. Do they know where he is? No, but they'll find him. Now that the FBI is involved, Vilya said after reading silently to herself for a few minutes. The FBI? Delia whispered in disbelief. Yep. According to this, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is looking for us. Vilya continued reading on. Exploited, I corrected. What? Vilya asked, looking at me like I was confusing her. Exploited. Exploited, not exploded. I explained. The National Center for Missing and Exploit Exploited Children. Whatever, Vilya said. So what are we going to do? Turn ourselves in? Juanita asked. She took the newspaper from the twins and turned her and took her turn reading it. Well, we have to get back as soon as possible, Delia told her, to get Mama out of trouble. Vilya slumped back in her seat and crossed her arms. It's our fault. We should have left her a note or something. Too late for that, Delia said. The best thing we can do now is to get to Abula's house and call her from there. If we don't call home soon, they're going to arrest her because I bet you a million dollars they're not looking for us down here. Oh yes, they are, Juanita said, shoving the paper at Delia. It says here, the FBI is working with both Border Patrol and the Mexican Federals to try to find us. The girls had the right idea, calling mama and telling her we were alive and well and visiting with our Abdullah would solve her problem. But there was still getting there. The way I figured we couldn't be very far, somewhere between 20 or 25 miles off. If I couldn't find the exit, the biggest challenge was there was no official markers on the county road that led to Hebeca Drada. 
we just had to follow an unpaved road beyond El Sacrifastro, travel about 20 minutes, watch for a crooked fork in the road and turn into it. For there, it was another 15 miles on a dirt path and straight shot to Jaguetes Doranda. Why are they going to arrest us? Peter asked from the back seat. I don't want to go to Juvie. That's a really bad place. They have, they have no reason to arrest us, I told Peter, making eye contact with her through the rear view mirror. We haven't done anything wrong, so we have nothing to worry about. At least, not so far. We found a dead body and didn't report it, Delia whispered more to herself than the rest of us. We should have reported it. Saved ourselves and mama a lot of trouble. I pulled over to the side of the road, reached up and pulled Papa's road map off the visor, unfolding it over my lap to read it better. I glanced at the mileage gauge and made a mental note to use it to measure our progress. If we travel more than 20 miles ahead and we haven't found the exit, we'd certainly passed it. I'd have to turn around and look for the fork in the road again. We took Papa's car without permission, Delia said, looking over at me. Well, if he was so interested in the car, why didn't he take it with him? Juanita wanted to know. He didn't take it because it's older than dirt, Delia said. I'm surprised the thing still runs. We should turn ourselves in, Peter said, touching my shoulder from behind to get my attention. We wouldn't go to jail, would we? None of those things are bad enough to get us arrested. Trust me, we've broken plenty of laws, but I don't think we've done anything that would make us go to jail. I said, maintaining a normal tone of voice with the hope of reassurance. The best thing we can do right now is to get to Abula Remini's house as soon as possible and ask for her help. I think it's about time we let an adult handle this. We knew last night we'd gotten in over our heads when we'd crash at the Cancieras, but with the police and the FBI thinking we are kidnapped or dead, I wasn't sure we weren't in big trouble. I started the car and got us back on the road, but my mind kept churning it over. Juanita had first noted it before we left and Delia had reminded us failing to report a body was punishable by law. The question was, who would they punish for us? Us or mama? Adults had a funny way of seeking justice. Would they go after mama? Could they make her responsible for this? If our actions had damaged our family in any way, I would never forgive myself. Juanita's thoughts seemed to be on the same track as mine. We took the drowned man's money, she admitted quietly. Then she put her hands over her face so we couldn't see her crying. But we returned it, most of it anyways. I said, keeping my eyes on the road. Velia pulled out a small wad of folded bills from her pockets and handed it to Juanita. Yeah, but we still have some of it and who knows where it came from, who it really belongs to. Juanita threw the cash on the dashboard and turned away to look out the window. As a tall desiccated tree that seemed to loom over us as we drove on. It's probably blood money. Her words silenced everyone in the car, and for a while, nobody said anything. I thought about La Lorola then and wondered if she knew how much trouble this journey would cause. She was from another place, another time. What made sense in her world did not make sense in ours. Why had I listened to her? I should have thought things through. As apprehensive as apprehension spread into every pore of my being, I did the one thing I could to quiet the guilt in my mind. I turned the radio on, but even with the sound of loud music reverberating through the car, I could still hear my conscience nagging at me. You should have stopped this, all of it, it whispered. There is more your fault than anyone else. You're the oldest. You should have known better. Disgusted with myself, I quieted my thoughts and concentrated on driving the car. The sun was in full bloom, blinding me 
as I tried to look for a crook fork in the road ahead. To make things worse, the air was hot and blistering, burning our cheeks as we drove on. We drove like that for a few more miles, everyone keeping her thoughts to herself. When suddenly I smelled something humid and foul. Actually, I tasted it before I smelled it. But then I saw it, the white puffed out of the front of the car, crept in through the vents in the dashboard, penetrating my lungs and causing me to cough uncontrollably. Yes, Drabo, what the helicopter is going on? Vilya sat forward in her seat and stuck her face out the window to get a better look. The whiteness of the smoke was blinding. I could barely see the side of the road and nothing ahead. My first reaction was to press down on the brake with all of my weight. The car, the car screeched to a stop on the side of the road and I flipped the gear shift into park. But even without raising the hood of the car, I knew what was wrong. When the water started pouring from the front of the car onto the pavement, creating a buzzling puddle inches away from our feet, I knew we were doomed. I seen this happen to Papa before. The radiator was busted. What do we do now? Peter asked. She was standing next to me while the others stood back behind me, fanning the smoky steam out of their eyes. I looked at the mileage gauge. We we're only about 15 miles down the road from where we started in El Sacrifasto, but it was far enough that going back there wouldn't be too smart. It might call more attention to us, the missing children. And 15 miles was a long, long way to walk, longer than just walking the rest of the way to a bluest, a bluest. At least, I hope it was. We walk, I said, fighting the sense of despair that was slowly seeping into my heart. Because this piece of junk isn't going anywhere without a mechanic. Walk where? Vilya wanted to know. We're in the middle of nowhere. Delia finished her twin's thought. I looked around and saw nothing. There were no houses, no animals, no major roads. Stretched before us in every direction, there was only miles of mesquite and hibiscus trees and tall brown grassy grasses, too dry and thin to feed to animals. If we turn around now, it would take us more than half a day to walk beyond on El Sacrifacer and up to Highway 57 on foot, but that's where the nearest gas station was. I didn't even know if that gas station had a tow truck, though we could use the phone there. It was better to just keep moving forward since by my calculations, we were closer to Abula's house. The truck was gonna be hard on us, especially without water to fight off the searing heat that was already burning through my clothes. I wished I'd thought about getting water instead of sodas at the Piscas before setting out this morning. To Abulas, I said, take whatever you want out of the car and let's get moved on. No use standing around here. We have a long way to go before we reach Hibiscus Doraitas. I dug Papa's map and the envelope with my earrings out of the glove box and stuffed them into my bag. With our backpacks, purses, and the few provisions, we still had in the car in tow. We started down the road, heading east. We left the blankets behind because we didn't want the exhaust ourselves with too much to carry. Mama would probably want to kill us for leaving them, but there was no other option. Perhaps we'd be able to return for the car and the rest of our things with Abula's help. The morning sun grew hotter in by the minute and we were sweating profusely within half an hour. Several things along the way. Peter cried that it it was either tired or that she was either tired or thirsty. And we had to stop and sit on the side of the road under the mesquite or hibiscus tree, trying to make the trek without subsucumb, succumbing to heat exhaustion. Two and a half hours later, we were huddled together on the side of the road shoulder to shoulder under the full shade of a large cluster of scraggly trees when we heard it, a woman's voice, sweet and mellowed, coming from the brush behind us. She sang of flowers, gardens, 
and sweet, sweet nectar oozing from every petal of and leaf. What's that about? Juanita asked, turning to look at me. My heart quickened. Never talk to strangers. Mama's warning rattled around in the back of my head. We hadn't seen any houses along the dirt road. I scrambled to my feet and stood, listening for a moment. That woman's voice was engagingly and lovely. She sounded nothing like La Larola, and my apprehensive be began to subside. I don't know, but we should be careful. Ignoring Mama's rule, the rest of the girls scrambled to their feet. I ran to see where the enchanting voices was coming from. Hello, Velia hollered into the dense thickness. She squeezed between the trunks of two mesquite trees in an attempt to avoid going around. Hello, Delia chimed in louder and more desperately than her twin. She had been complaining about being dehydrated for at least an hour and human life meant the possibility of water. Who are you? Who's there? Who's singing? My sisters all hollered in the general direction of the woman's voice. What are you girls doing out here? The woman's voice asked from somewhere behind the brush. The lady who emerged was lovely and petite. She wore a flowery, bright yellow dress and her blonde hair was perfectly coughed into a thick chagon. Our car broke down, I said, as she came closer, can you tell us how far it is to the next town? Immediately, the enchanted woman began doting on us like a tiny yellow butterfly fluttering around. Her words fiddled up and down and all around us as she fretted, taking our reddening faces in her hands and looking into our eyes, inspecting each of us in turn for a sign of heat stroke. Where did you come from? Ay, Maria, Parzada, but you look dreadful. You must be absolutely parched, melting away in this heat. We need to head to Habasca Doradas as soon as possible, I said when she pulled out an embroidered handkerchief and swabbed at Peter's small face in a concerned, almost motherly manner. Can you give us a ride? Oh, I wish I could, the woman said, but I don't have a car. Oh my, but you must be parched by now. You look like wilting flowers. You need something to drink? Come with me. I have just the thing. She invited us to a property, a desolate piece of land we would have never imagined was inhabited so far enough back from the road that we hadn't seen it through the trees. I was so relieved to see someone, anyone, that I didn't question her sudden appearance. She was a godsend. I was grateful for the sight of her. Besides, she didn't look like she could be part of a gang or some kind of kidnapping ring. So we followed the sweet voiced woman as she led us deeper and deeper into the brush, past a wasted field and through a graveyard of fallen mesquite, we went listening to her melodicotic words as she led us away until we came to what can only be described as an oasis in the desert. Whereas the land we just crossed had been populated by hibiscus and shrubs, her house was large and impeccably landscaped like the house in the more affluent neighborhoods of Eagle Pass. With a beautiful garden of flowering plants and herbs, I recognized the orange bursts of butterfly weeds and the tall red Indian paint brushes. But there were so many beautiful plants in the garden. All I could do was smile with joy and serenity. The woman's house was beautiful too, with bride resplendent windows reflecting the daylight on every side, making it glitter and shine majestically. I thought for a moment we were in a fantasy world, a magical land, a dream come true. The vivac vi vicacious woman took us through her spacious living room and into a splendid sunlit kitchen where we were asked to sit at a long mahogany table while our hostess poured us glass is after tall glass of ice cold lemonade. When she had quenched our thirst, 
she brought a platter full of sweet bread, pumpkin and potted, potted hove, canary, cornies, and the most delicious mariantas, dense pastries shaped like piggies, made with sweet molasses and filled with spicy richness in every morsel. We ate so much sweet bread and consumed so much tart lemonade. We felt gluttonous, but sinfully contented. We listened. We felt, we listened to the lady of the house as she entertained us with her life story, feeling delightfully blessed. Our enchanted hostess was named Cecilia. She was a vitigo, a long suffering widow. Her husband had been a police officer, a detective who had lost his life in the line of duty. She said she served us more and more of the delicious sweetbread. She was glad for our company because she lived too far from the nearest town to entertain visitors. Since she was self-sufficient, relying on her garden and animals for sustenance, she didn't know anyone in town. Having no other family to speak of also meant she hadn't had visitors since the days of her marriage. Her only content with the outside world was her supplying delivery once a month. Our long hot day in the sun was too much to contend with and soon we fell asleep. We made pigs of ourselves. Now we wanted nothing more than to take a nap in the afternoon heat. You look tired. Cecilia said, pulling the tray of pastries off the table and placing them back on the counter behind her. Perhaps you should rest a while. I watched her with half closed lids as Cecilia moved about the room with slow, gentle movements that mesmerized me. We should go. I whispered more to myself than her. Come on now, Cecilia said as she turned off lights in the kitchen. I have the perfect spot for a nap. My husband built this cozy little den just for me. Come on, it's right through here. Being so happy to have us in her home, Cecilia made us comfortable in a small nook just off the kitchen, away from the sun and the heat of the day, like a fairy godmother waving a magical wand. She tapped open a cabinet door and pulled out extra fluffy pillows so that we might rest comfortably in the sofa and recover from our Adorous exp expedition. Those hours resting went by fast. We slipped in and out of wakefulness, wincing from the soreness in our muscles and thirsting for more of that tart lemonade. Finally, we slept so deeply that we were shocked when we awoken to find the landscape outside the window in complete darkness. It seemed we had slept the day away and nighttime had descended upon the spacious house like an unexpected guest. What happened? Vilya asked, yawning as she stretched on a stainy div divine chair. Peter's face was illuminated by the light of the moon and from an open window. Her cheeks were flushed on bright crimson, sunburnt from our walking this morning. Where is she? Do you think she knows who we are? Vilya asked as she got up and went to peer through the open door into the dark and kitchen. I wondered myself if she had gotten a paper all the way out here. I hope she doesn't get us arrested. Peter went scooting over to sit next to me on a plush sofa. Suddenly a familiar pangs of guilt hit me again and I winced. I hated seeing them so concerned. They were little girls. They should be at home fashioning bracelets out of old aluminum cans or just sitting at the kitchen table playing La Tinina with Mama. Juanita pushed herself off the couch and stood looking out the window at the darkness outside. Do you think she's gone? She wouldn't have left us here alone, would she? Girls, are you awake? Come in here. Cecilia's musical voice made us all jump, startled. We followed her voice into the living room where she was sitting before a giant old fashioned television, 
that must have been brought in from somewhere else in the house because it was so fat and bulky. There was no way she could have missed it when we first enter. How was your nap? She asked, lifting a silver platter full of tiny, delicately decorated sweets. Whew, what are those? Peta's eyes sparkled with delight as she was all but devouring the baby cakes on the platter. Pedophores, Celia said, smiling indulgently at the expression on Peta's face. Try a chocolate one. They're my favorite. I thought about Cecilia if she had a phone we could use, but the reporter's somber face on the television screen caught my attention. What are you watching? I asked. I popped a creamy pedophore into my mouth. It melted away too quickly, leaving a smoothie minty aftertaste that made me want more. Oh, listen to this. It's coming on again. Cecilia turned up the volume on the television. They've been running your story on the news all day. At her words, the girls abandoned the tray of pedophores and scrambled to sit on, in front of the television set. I felt on the nearest couch and I listened as the words story in development scrolled across the screen in Spanish and an ominous tone began to play in the background. The first segment of the news was an interview with INS and Zagiasa. Both women seemed horrified at the idea that they had been deceived by the five little sisters who seemed to be so generous, so pure of heart. They kept telling the reporter they didn't know why they believed us, that our mother knew where we were and felt terrible for not calling the authorities or at least getting in touch with our mother. They talked about the dead man's return and the bride's hat they had given one of the girls as a token of their appreciation. But most of all, they worried about our safety and hoped we would be located soon. Feeling the blood rushing from my face, I looked around for a phone in the room, but I couldn't see one. I was just about to ask Cecilia if she even had one when the tray of pedophores started making its way around the room again. I took two and ate them absently. I knew I had to do something, call someone, but my mind was suddenly blank and I couldn't think about it. I was needed to what I needed to do. I couldn't even talk. In the second news segment, after a brief commercial break, a female reporter pointed to a wide brimmed hat stuck on the branch of a tall mesquite while she informed the viewers that the missing girl's broken down car had been abandoned less than a mile down the road from the location of the discarded hat. She reported that at that time, only terrible conclusions could be reached because there were no signs of the sisters. Our previous plan to return for Papa's car evaporated when we saw it being towed away on television. According to the newscaster, it was being taken in for forensic analysis. The third segment of the story was previously taped interviews with our mother. On the screen, Mama was crying and blowing her nose with a tissue. She wasn't making any sense, but she kept repeating the same thing in Spanish. Over and over again, she begged, please, please, if you have my daughters, please let them go. Let them come home. They're all I've got. The sight of mama complete, completely undone on the news. Peter broke down and started crying silently. Oh, I know you miss your mama. Cecilia cooed as she reached out to pull Peter beside her on the couch. Come here, darling. Everything's gonna be okay, I promise. After Peter settled down and stopped crying, we were ab all able to concentrate on the rest of the news broadcast. The fourth and final segment of the story development was a live interview with the chief of police at the Pidas Negradas. Alfonso Gepranes disclosed that the drowned man, Gabriel Percadas, was a known drug dealer and fugitive. The Federals were investigating his death and the culprits behind it. Chief Gepranes speculated that the girls might have been abducted by the same individuals who killed Gabriela Pedatas. They believe the suspects were operating under the assumption that the girls knew more than they really did about the dead man's drug dealings. They suspected the abductors were manipulating the girls' actions. 
as they traveled through Mexico to return the body to his family in El Sacrifice. The kidnapping might have all been part of a ploy to flush out Gabriel's cohorts. We don't know for sure anything is possible, Chief Jimenez says, claiming it was imperative they find the missing girls and bring them home safely. He assumed the reporters that his men were working night and day on the case, and he was positive justice would prevail. By the time our news story ran through, the local newscast was over. They had dedicated an entire show to us, a fact that mesmerized us into complete and utter silence. Don't believe everything you hear, Cecilia said, shutting off the television set with one click of her remote control. That Jimenez is a corrupt and coddled. His position on the force is just a front. He's suspected of being in business with the mafia. Only he's so cunning, so sly, no one can connect him to any of their crimes. But everybody knows he's working both sides. I don't understand, I whispered. If he's such a bad guy, how can he say he wants to bring us home? Of course he wants to bring you home, Cecilia said, leaning out over the coffee table to be close to us. Don't you see? He wants to find you because he thinks you know more than you should about the drug dealers you brought home. It's a trick. You should avoid him at all costs. I'm scared. Peter slid off the couch and scooted over to me at the floor. Oh, honey, don't be scared, Cecilia said, leaving the comfort of the couch to slide down on the floor between Pita and me. He can't hurt you, not as long as you stay with me. I promise. Why? You're trembling. Here, have some more pedophores, sugar for my sweet one. There you go. Feel better? Peter bit into tiny sweet morsels of cake and nodded, even as she sniffed back her tears, noticing the twins' fearful faces. Cecilia slid the tray of pedophores towards them. Soon, we were all sitting on the floor, sharing the enormous tray of pedophores. Funny how distresses takes away someone's appetite, takes away one's appetite for real food. But when sweets are involved, all bets are off. Or maybe it was just because we sat there and ate every last pedophore offered to us as we looked guiltily at each other for eating so greedily while everyone worried about us back home. At least mama's home, not in jail, Velia whispered close to my ear so the others wouldn't hear. I'm not so sure that's any comfort to her right now. Dilia said from the other side of the coffee table. She looks pretty torn up. Maybe we should call her. I've been meaning to ask if you have a phone we could use, I said, turning to look at Cecilia. Freedom is always a comfort, Selena said. Cecilia said, ignoring my request and thrusting a chocolate pedophore into my hands. Your mama is lucky to be free. After neglecting you all the way she did, what do you mean? Who says she neglected us? I asked, sus suspicions creeping into the corner of my mind, even as I put the chocolate treat in my mouth. I shook my head, trying to remember if any of us had spoken rudely about mama, but my thoughts were cloudy, eerily void of memory, a fact that stupefied me. Biting into the tiny sugar-covered cake, I gave each of the girls, the evil eye, letting them know mama was not a topic that we needed to discuss, not with the perfect stranger like Cecilia. I mean, I don't know exactly what happened or why you are traveling alone, Cecilia started, blinking nervously as she spoke, but I know if you were my daughters, I'd never part with you. If you were my daughters, you'd be safe at home eating delicious things I'd baked and wearing nice, beautiful clothes I made. I sew the most exquisite dresses. If you were my daughters, I'd dress you up like pretty little China dolls. Well, you're not the dress up, we're not the dress up type, I said, 
picking up another sugary pedophore and biting into the top myself, defending mama's honor to the point of being rude to our hostess. After we ate, we started to drift into a sedate sleeplessness again. All I could think of is that we were so emotionally drained from listening to the news and worrying about mama that even sugar wasn't able to pick us up. And so we drifted into the delicately dream stage before falling completely asleep. Seeing us lullering, lullering our heads like droopy violets, Cecilia told us to go upstairs and pick out a bedroom to sleep in. Go now, Cecilia insisted, you need your rest. We really need to get going, I said, my eyelids resting heavily over my eyes. We need to go to our Bula's house. What you need is a long, relaxing bath. Come on, it was clear your heads. Cecilia got up and started for the stairs. We bathe in luxury, Cecilia singing harmlessly as she went filling all three tubs in the upstairs bathrooms with bubbles. We dozed blissfully in the scented water until we looked like prunes. And then because we could hardly walk from the drowsiness brought on by those hot, delicious baths, we headed right to bed. Peter slept with Juanita in a luxurious, decorative pink room while the twins shared a sunny yellow room. I picked a heavenly blue master bedroom with a king size bed and French double doors. All those little windows in the French doors allowed the shimmering of the moonlight to come in and kiss everything in the room with a glittery silver dust. After my bath, I slipped between the soft, crisp bed sheets, happy and content. And for the first time in a long time, I didn't pray, pray for Papa to come home. I didn't pray for Mama to start paying attention to us. I didn't even pray for my sisters because somehow I knew we were all going to be all right. For the first time in a very long time, I thank God for a warm, comfortable bed in a nice, safe home. I awoken in the middle of the night, moonlight streamed in through the windows and thought my vision was hazy. I could see the curtains billowing back and forth in a mariara came into the room in a mischievous gust of wind and toyed with my senses as they entered my lungs and played with my sanity. Going, never again. Home is an illusion. Home is where you've never been. Never again, never again. El Mirazes said as it spoke to me, whispering and singing, murmuring incoherent things, jumbled words, rambling thoughts I could not understand. Remembering where I was, I tried to get up to look for Cecilia but I couldn't focus, much less keep my eyes open. When I tried sitting up, my head spun and I fell back on the bed, dead weight on my pillow. That's when I finally understood what was going on. Something's wrong, I whispered. I went through the events of the day in my mind and realized that Cecilia never promised she would help us get to Gendas Dorentes. She'd acted so kindly towards us but her lack of interest in our plight, our need to get to Abula's house frightened me. But wasn't it a given? She knew what we were going through. She showed us the TV news, right? I tried to clear my head, wake up. We have to get out of here. But my voice sounded like a distant storm, dying, waning in my ears. I tried to pick up my head, to touch my head, to reach my ear pendant, but my hand were made of lead. My arms were wooden. Lola Rola, I called out in a breathless voice. Can you hear me, Lola Rola? Something's wrong, Lola Rola. Please help me. 